Hello, everybody. I hope your your uh, lessons are progressing well and you're keeping up to date with things. Welcome to the Biology 30 Online Anytime Unit 5 review. All right, let's get right into it. So in the previous unit, you learned about um, meiosis and the formation of sex cells, haploid cells. Now, in this case, the sex cells of a pea plant. The pollen is from a pea plant with round shaped seeds and the egg of a pea plant with wrinkled shaped seeds. Now, in the unit before that, you learned that fertilization was the combining of the sex cells. And that forms the, the diploid zygote. Diploid because the cells have homologous pairs of chromosomes. Homologous meaning um, not identical, but similar, having the same length, centromere position, and by having the same banding patterns. The banding patterns are not genes, by the way. They're the variations in density of the chromatin when it condenses to form chromatids prior to the cell dividing. Now at the seed shape gene, one of the chromosomes is carrying the round shape allele, while the homologous chromosome is carrying the wrinkled shape allele. So this is what I mean by the chromosomes not being completely identical. They have the same gene at the same positions, but there are two forms of the gene that we call alleles. So in this case, a round seed allele and a wrinkled seed allele. So this cell is heterozygous for seed shape. Now, when the cell is about to divide, the DNA is replicated. And during prophase, when we, uh, we'll see that the chromatids are actually attached to their uh, identical sister at the centromere. Now, if this is a cell that will divide to produce sex cells, then the first step is to separate the homologous partners because sex cells are haploid, right? Uh, each sex cell, uh, only has one of the homologous pair. So this is what Mendel referred to as the law of segregation. The homologous pairs um, would separate, meaning each allele would end up with its own sex cell. Now, any one of these sex cells from plant A could be fertilized by any combination of ways with the sex cells from plant B. Now, Mendel decided to only study one trait of the many traits of pea plants to see if he could identify a pattern of inheritance. When geneticists are only studying the inheritance patterns of one trait at a time, we call this monohybrid inheritance. Of the thousands of pea plants um, that he made between the true breeding round seed plant and the true breeding wrinkled seed plant, all the offspring came out round seeded. And then when he self-fertilized those round seeded offspring, the wrinkled seeds reappeared. So when an allele seems to hide the expression of another allele, the allele is said to be dominant. Now he created a special nomenclature to keep track of these alleles that he called genotypes. So the dominant allele would carry the capital letter. The other, the recessive allele, would carry the lowercase version of the same letter. So knowing that genotypes of a pea plant means then you can actually know its phenotype or seed shape appearance in this case. So it doesn't work the other way. The phenotype doesn't necessarily translate to the correct 
genotype. The dominant allele can be found in the homologous form or the heterozygous form, each producing the same phenotype. Now, inheritance patterns of monohybrid crosses in pea plants became predictable and was actually enhanced when the Punnett squares were used uh, to track the movements of different alleles. Punnett square also illustrates nicely how the second generation of pea plants were observed to show a three to one phenotypic ratio. So in the sex cells of two heterozygous plants, were fertilized, only one of the four possibilities showed the wrinkled seed uh, phenotype. It is important to realize that the Punnett square does not predict numbers, but rather probabilities. In other words, if a pea plant heterozygous for both traits is self-fertilized, as shown in this Punnett square, and only has four offspring, it does not mean that one of those four will be the wrinkled seeded plant. What it does mean is that there is a one in four chance of the offspring will have uh, wrinkled seeds. So another way to look at probabilities is a chance of a boy being born to a pregnant woman uh, or a girl. It's actually independent of what came before. So if she gave birth to a boy before, it does not mean the next is going to be a girl, even though the probability is one chance in two. She could still have five boys in a row before a girl comes along. And after five boys, the chance of the next being a girl is still one chance in two. So when expressing probability in numeric response or written response questions, make sure to carefully determine how the probability value is to be expressed. So you might determine that the chance of something happening is 75%. But if the question is asking for a probability value between zero and one rounded to two decimal places, then it's looking for 0 0.25. And don't forget the zero, by the way. Shame to do all the work to get the correct probability, but express it incorrectly. Another variation of inheritance patterns of monohybrid crosses is the test cross. So test crosses are so easy to identify and they get missed by students so frequently. Any scenario where you're trying to identify the genotype of a dominant trait by crossing it with the recessive trait is a test cross. So black wool color in sheep, for example, is a recessive trait. Crossing it with a white sheep confirms the white sheep is heterozygous. Now, if the um, yeah, black wool color recessive. So crossing it with a white sheep confirms the white sheep is heterozygous and not homozygous dominant if any of the offspring come out with black wool. So this picture hopefully communicates the difference between incomplete dominance and co-dominance. Incomplete dominance reveals um, a third blended phenotype, a cross between a red flower and a uh, white flower, where neither allele is dominant, produces a pink when genotypically heterozygous. Codominance is when both phenotypes are simultaneously expressed. Cross between a red flower and a white flower produces a red and white flower when genotypically heterozygous. Now, some genes do not have any variation at all and are only the uh, single allele. Um, the genes we've been talking about have really two alleles, but there are many genes that have multiple alleles. A commonly used example is the eye color in the Drosophila melanogaster or vinegar fly. Now in this case, the multiple alleles are indicated um, with a superscripted number and placed 
in an order of hierarchy with E1 being the most dominant and E4 being the most recessive. So these flies are diploid, meaning they won't have any more than two of these alleles, but be sure to write the more dominant allele first. It's a good habit and limits the chance of making mistakes when identifying uh, phenotypes. Now, despite its appearance, this isn't supposed to be a Punnett square. It's the genotypic combinations for blood types based around three alleles. The A allele that produces a certain protein on the surface of red blood cells, the B allele that produces a different protein on the surface of red blood cells, and the O allele that does not produce any protein at all. So as you can see from this table, the A and B alleles display co-dominance. Otherwise, both A and B alleles are dominant to the O allele, which is why the symbol used for blood typing, the letter I, is lowercase for the O allele. So you can be sure these types of questions, um, like um, can a blood type AB parent and a heterozygous A parent have a blood type O offspring? They're definitely going to be appearing in your exam. Now, other types of questions that uh, involve Uh, the popular, that really are popular with um, blood type questions are the pedigrees. Now, pedigrees, remember, those charts that diagram um, heredity. Squares are males, circles females. And where they connect, they're a breeding pair. Now, when you look at, in this particular diagram, individual 4, 1, what would the genotypes of the empty symbols be if we wanted to make individual 41 a a blood type AB? Now look in the key notes for uh, the study guide, the key, uh, for as many of these questions as you can. So there'll be a few of these questions. Now you can tell by uh, looking at a pedigree what type of inheritance you're looking at. Um, traits caused by genes appearing on autosomes affect males and females with equal frequency. Now beware of pedigrees that only show a few individuals. The larger the pedigree, the more reliable your prediction. So whether autosomal or X-linked, dominant traits will appear frequently in pedigrees and do not skip generations. And anytime you see an imbalance between affected males and females, assume that it's due to the gene being found on the X chromosome. And remember, males only inherit their X chromosomes from their mothers. Males only pass down their Y chromosome to their sons. And uh, many students like these questions. Those who struggle usually have a problem visualizing distances. And if this is you, maybe use a ruler and make scaled uh, measurements. All right, so in chromosome mapping, the steps are the same no matter how many genes you're asked to map. Begin with a well, drawing a line like I just put here. And this represents the chromosome along which all of these genes are going to be found. Next, look at the table and look for the longest distance or frequency of crossing over or separation between two genes. These are going to mark the outer boundaries of the map. Now, the other genes are actually going to fall within these boundaries. So I see 45% frequency of separation between genes B and C. So the other genes are going to fall between these boundaries. Now, the next thing we do is we're going to look for the next long distance that includes one of these two genes. Now, 
So B and D have a frequency of separation of 40%. So I'm going to mark that on my map. Next is the distance between A and C. Now I can see that to calculate the distance between genes A and B is simply determine the difference between 45 and 30. So not that bad after all, 15% in this case. And notice as well that my lines A, B, C, D, my, my gene locations, they're not really to scale. I'm just eyeballing these distances. It is important to remember that genes found on the same chromosome like this or linked genes uh, would have been hugely problematic for Mendel because linked genes don't show predictable patterns of heredity the way genes found on different chromosomes do. This is why pea plants were a great choice for Mendel. See, he didn't know it at the time, but all the traits he was observing, seed shape, plant height, pod color, all of them, they were controlled by their own gene on their own chromosome. So if any of these genes had been linked, Mendel would not have envisioned, envisioned his uh, law of segregation. So paired alleles appearing during meiosis and distributed into different gametes, that's his law of segregation. And when studying two unlinked genes, as in dihybrid crosses, uh, we do have predictable patterns of inheritance. Now, the most comprehensive of the dihybrid crosses is going to be the double heterozygous cross, since each parent produces four genotypically different gametes. We end up with a 16 square Punnett square, a square you'll never have to draw and waste time on. As long as you remember the nine to three to three to one phenotypic ratios produced by this double heterozygous cross. Problem is, is the reason why people do still default to drawing a full 16 square Punnett square is they forget what the nine to three to three to one ratio really means. So it just means nine out of the 16 possible outcomes will show that both dominant traits will be expressed. Say, for example, purple flowers and round seeds. So out of our 16 square Punnett square, nine of them are going to be both showing the dominant traits. Three out of the 16 are going to be showing one dominant trait, and the other one is recessive. For example, the purple flowers with wrinkled seeds. Three out of the other three out of the 16 is going to be uh, showing the other trait is dominant while well, that one is recessive. So like, for example, white flowers and round seeds. And then finally, there's a one chance in 16 that the offspring will exhibit both recessive traits, having white flowers and wrinkled seeds. So the only way to do well in this exam and the final exam really is to practice. Get your hands on as many questions as possible. And there's lots on the Moodle site. And if you have a copy of the key study guide, then that's also a great resource for practicing. Plus, go online, go on the internet, put in uh, Diploma Exams for Biology 30 Alberta, and you'll have lots of uh, exam questions. The only, unlike any of the other units where you just simply memorize a bunch of facts, this requires that there's, there's no way I can give you enough questions where you're going to see the exact same questions appear on the exam. So it's just going to take practice. All right, so there you go. Um, does anybody have any questions? I see what Daniel here. Do, does, does anybody have any questions? Because I'm, I'm really done with the... Um, uh, with the review. If there's any um, 
uh, I will post the recording of this as soon as the video becomes available, which should be a few hours after this, and I'll uh, stick it on Moodle so you can get everything. All right, so within maybe the next uh, few weeks, I will do a uh, unit six review for the for anybody interested in it. I'll have that in a couple of weeks. So in the meantime, good luck with your studies, folks. And as always, if you have any questions, please throw me an email. I'm happy to chat to you, and we can even set up times like this, for example, on the on Blackboard Ultra, where I can host little tutor sessions if you need it. All right, enjoy the rest of your day, folks.